Well, we're continuing to look at the book of Jude in verse 3, Contending for the Faith. We would introduced, introduced a subject last week that contending is twofold. And so we contend for the faith, otherwise we want to make sure that we uh, have a continuum of right doctrine. But in the purpose of contending for the faith, is to have something that will be available for people, for souls. Uh, the truth, or the faith, is the medium in which we work, in which we minister. And so we have to be careful to maintain both of these things. Sometimes we can fight so aggressively for the faith that we lose the ministry uh, and there, thereby... Uh, lose the purpose for, for which we contend for the faith. So we left off last week uh, dealing with what we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at some somewhat of this in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, if you want to go over there tonight. But just as a preface to this, in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18, Paul there talks about the warfare, and of course he talks there about warfare against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness uh, of this world, against spiritual witness high places. These are all against. And they are trying to, of course, overthrow the faith. He goes on to talk about the believer's armament then. And he talks about commanding believers to what? Take up the whole armor of God. Why? That you be able to be that you may be able to withstand, of course, in battle in the evil day against the onslaughts of evil, and having done all to stand. Otherwise, stand and, and, and fight. Of course, standing in these verses refers to standing in battle against the influences of evil as they oppose. Uh, to uh, retreating, uh, as opposed to retreating in, feet, in defeat, we stand. And that's where we always have to be willing to understand. We have never have a right to compromise the truth in any way when we are contending for the faith. We must always stand, otherwise we stand our ground. We're not going to change the truth. But how we stand our ground is going to be somewhat of the substance we deal with tonight. So Paul uses a similar analogy here to describe the struggle of the faith in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8 and 9. Listen to this. He says, but let us who are of the day, otherwise we're not people who are working in the night. We're not sneaking around in the shadows. We're not covertly uh, trying to do what we do. We do it right out in the open. So when I go door knocking or go soul winning or go visitation, I don't go somewhere hiding my Bible. I purposely carry a big Bible because I want to know people, people to know that when I come, what I'm coming for. And usually I introduce myself right away. So he says, but let us who are of the day be sober, serious. Putting on, now look at there's two things here. Putting on both of these. First of all, the breastplate of, breastplate of, of faith. Put that on. And love for a helmet of salvation. So we're supposed to put on both of these. Uh, the hope of salvation. That's of course the resurrection. He says, for God hath not appointed us to wrath. Otherwise he's appointed us to glorification. That's predestination is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And predestin predestination of glorification. But to obtain, this is to acquire, to acquire the end of salvation. And here, of course, it's used in the sense of the final victory over the flesh, 
in the believer's glorification uh, and reign, redemption of the body with Christ and the kingdom age. So we have this salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to call us out of this world. Now all of these are militant terms. In 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 8, the emphasis of the battle against the forces of evil is the guaranteed victory by our Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. We are already more than conquerors through him that loved us. What's a more than conqueror? That's a guy that never has to really fight uh, that battle because it was already won on the cross of Calvary. So the emphasis of the warfare of the believer is simply to be faithful in the battle, which is already won. Why then fight if the victory is already won? Because as we battle by faith for the faith, those fighting against us who are under the influences of evil are one to Christ and joined with us through their faith in Christ in the guaranteed victory. So we're fighting against those who have been deceived, and in our battle, we're not trying to kill them, we're trying to win them to Christ. And so that's that's a big, big, big contending issue. So we have a tendency of contending, contending for the faith, and we really don't care how many people um, maybe we might offend or whatever else might happen in the process. But in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, if you want to go over there, Paul uses similar military terminology to describe there the spiritual struggles of men now in the pastorate. This is primarily pastoral, but it's applicable to all Christians. He says, Thou therefore, my son, speaking to Timothy, he had trained him to be a pastor, be strong in the grace, the enabling of the indwelling spirit that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. This is building this continuum of men who are trained and, uh, of course, the, to do the work of the ministry. Now, whether that is pastoral, obviously some of these men are going to be pastoral. And some of them are going to be uh, individuals within the church. So thou therefore endure hardness as what? What's the term? A good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him, Jesus, who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, I've had all kinds of people say all kinds of things about this, but so a pastor, for instance, should never uh, work vocationally in another job. Well, yeah, wasn't Paul a tent maker? Uh, wasn't this a common practice of, of the members of the early church and uh, early pastors? Well, sure, I was a tent, tent maker, if you will, many times, not making tents, but uh, building homes and carpenter. And uh, obviously, this, this, this is not what this is talking about. So all the days that we live in this body of flesh, the Christian will be in, uh, be in an unending warfare contending for the faith. That is the ministry. The ministry is contending for the faith and in the process of contending and maintaining a biblical right doctrine, we do that for the purpose of keeping our tools sharp and, be, and usable. So there can be no allowance for compromise in any form for the enemy actually takes no prisoners. The enemy is described as the deceiver and the destroyer. Uh, he is described as the lion that devours his prey little bit by little bit or bite by bite. He destroys lives by getting people addicted to self-destruction, sinful practices, and perversions of theology. Uh, there is no one who will fight more tenaciously than who, he who has false doctrine. I've certainly found that to be true in, of Calvinist. His tactics are ancient, perfected in their use, and well developed in their application. He's been doing the same thing for thousands of years. And these tactics are always aimed at our faith and that they almost always question God's wisdom or question what God has said. 
thereby seeking to pervert understanding of both faith and truth. And the constant question we are bombarded with of every generation always intended to cast doubt upon our faith in God's word. So the history of those of faith throughout the Bible is a history of failure. Look, look, find one that there isn't a failure. The only one that we don't have recorded failure is Enoch, who walked with God and God took him. Or Jesus, he had no failures. Everybody, everyone else in the Bible has numerous failures. So the, the, throughout the Bible is a history of failures with those failures escalating in the generations that followed because of the duplicity of the parent generation in living their faith. Why did Solomon get messed up the way he did? Well, because dad did. King David. And why do we have generation after generation in Israel went into paganism? Because Solomon did. Oh, he got his heart right. But the generations that followed uh, didn't uh, follow really the repentance of the parent generation. So the history of those of faith throughout the Bible is a history of trying to minister to the people that witnessed the duplicity of the parent generation and decided their parents' faith was counterfeit and, their, counterfeit and therefore unworthy of duplication. And I want to tell you this. It doesn't take a whole lifetime. Sometimes it just takes one or two major failures in your life. Because very often they're looking for a failure to excuse their own, uh, their own uh, uh, departure. So the fact is that every single believer will fail in living for the Lord at some point in his or her life and will require forgiveness and a chance to start again. And how many times have you had to, had to start again? Can you count them all? I couldn't count them if I tried. I, I don't even remember most of them, but how many times do we, should we give a, people a, a chance to start again? Now, there's some trust issue that needs to be addressed, but in most cases, and this is going to happen many times throughout a lifetime. And we try very hard. It's the purpose of church discipline, not to remove someone from the church. That's a, you know, an extended uh, end, but the church discipline is to help somebody start again, to make sure that they're successful in that restart. We don't just do it over again, let them say, okay, here you are, you're on your own. Go do it. We stand alongside them and help them. So let's talk for a little while about contending for the truth while contending for the sinner. Contending for the truth while contending for the sinner. And we, we, we get focused upon orthodoxy, but we kind of let the orthopraxy forget. We, we kind of let that slip. So, you have orthodoxy, but heteropraxy. How, how we deal with this once we've contended for the faith, what do we do with the faith that we have preserved? If we don't do it right, then we're not really contending for the sinner, because that's a purpose of our contending for the truth, because we want to contend for the sinner. We want to have the tools necessary uh, to do that, but... No sense sharp, uh, sharpening your axe if it's just going to use to take off heads. Right? Uh, iron sharpeneth iron. Yes, it does. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, I love that verse of Scripture. Uh, but at the same time, it's not a matter just to sharpen the iron so we can take off heads. It's to keep it sharp. And the, really, the sword in the Bible is more of a scalpel than it is a long sword, which is a killing sword. So it's a surgical tool. So the need for compassionate forgiveness and the repeated need to give people opportunity to start again is so that doing this becomes a practical aspect of the faith exemplified through a believer's life. Now, we don't even make the differentiation so oftentimes between lost people and saved people when we're ministering to them. And quite frankly, you're just an amateur if you can't make that distinction. Lost people need one thing, Saved people need something else. And we're not trying to get lost people to look like saved people. We'll talk about that in a little while. And we're not getting, we're not going to be permissive to let saved people live like lost people. So there's two kinds of ministry here. 
and there are two mediums of using truth. So the failure to give compassionate forgiveness and the chance to start again and again, uh, if necessarily, is really the heart of Jesus' judge not that you be not judged command in Matthew 7, 1. One of the most misinterpreted portions of scripture in the Bible. So the judge not that you be not judged command was about the hypocrisy of judging others without the reciprocity of judging one's own life with the same standard of, of righteousness. This was one aspect of Phariseeism that reflected a counterfeit of practice in the, uh, of, of the faith. Otherwise, Christ said, this, this is not right. You have one uh, public standard of righteousness for everyone else, but you have another private standard of righteousness for yourself. As if God doesn't see that. So as long as it's not public and nobody knows about it, then you can live any way you want, I guess. But that's not the issue. They said, you're going to be judged the way you judge. But the point is, God sees everything. So such a contradiction to the practice of the faith was not to be condoned and not condoning it was not contending for the faith. Jude 3. So this is what Jesus addressed in Matthew chapter 23 declaring such practices as what? Hypocrisy. And those doing this to be what? Hypocrites. So all that can be produced by such hypocrisy is whitewashed sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Now this nonsense changes the outside appearance if it never touches the heart. What difference does it make if you can get a lost person to look like a Christian? Or even to live like one? What difference does it make? In fact, all it will do is confirm them in their own idea that, well, I'm a Christian, when they're really not. And quite frankly, we've seen that going on in Baptist churches for, for about 50 years now. And we have a lot of people that are whitewashed sepulchers. They're faithful. They come to church all the time. They even maybe read their Bibles. At least they can pray publicly and all the other things. But uh, really, they're just white, whitewashed sepulchers full of dead men's bones. They're lost. So one of the things we want to make sure, and Jesus did this over and over again, don't whitewash sepulchers. That's why over and over again he said to those who were following him, if you want to be followers of me, you want to be my disciple, here's some requirements. And he started whittling back quite radically those who were just following him and thereby calling themselves Christians. Of course, Christians wasn't in, term Christian wasn't invented so much later uh, at Antioch, but... Uh, calling themselves followers of, of the teachings of Jesus, when in fact they were not. They were just white walk sepulchers. And they weren't saved, weren't born again. So I'm going to go over to Matthew 7, this text, and we're going to look at two parts. Most of the time, this, this is not, uh, the verse, six verses here are not divided properly. We have the first part is verses 1 through 5, and then the second part is verse 6. Okay, so right in the margin of your Bible, part one, one through five. Part two, verse six. That's important. Well, part one, judge not that you be not judged. For, because, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So the principle here is not that you're not supposed to judge, but the principle is you better be very careful about how you judge, because with what manner of judgment you judge, that's how you're going to be. So, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, this beam, uh, or, or this sliver that's in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how, sh how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out that uh, little sliver out of thine eye, and here you've got a big old beam in your own eye. What's he say? Thou what? Hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye and then you can judge your brother. Get your own life right first. And then after you've got it right, you're coming to that other brother of which you want to help. 
get the silver out of their eye, you come to that other brother with humility because what have you just done? You've gotten your life straightened out and you were forgiven. And so you're coming not in pride, standing above them and saying, well, wow, look at me, I'm so good. No, you're, you're coming what? As a humble uh, sinner that's been forgiven. So he says, then shall thou see clearly how to help your brother, how to, how to cast the, um, out the moat out of thy brother's eye. You're, you're trying to help him, not, not condemn him. Now, now part two, verse six. Give not that which is holy or sacred unto dogs. Well, who are those? Those who hate truth and are hostile to righteousness. That's what a dog is. So imagine you're right here. Now you got two, two metaphors here or similes in this text. One's swine and one's a dog. And that's a snarling, snapping dog that's about ready to bite your head off. So what are you supposed to do with that snarling, snapping dog? What? <laughs> Well, don't give that which is sacred unto that person, the, these people who are hostile. Now the second metaphor, neither cast your pearls before swine. That's why, because they're unable to truly treasure the, the things of God's word. So don't cast your pearls, very precious things, before these swine who have, have, don't even understand the value of truth. So... It, why? Because they'll just trample them under their feet. These truths mean nothing to these types of people who view them as worthless. So, and what they're going to do, and then they're going to what? Turn again and rend you. In the hatred and rejection of God's convicting words, such people will turn on you as their enemies. So, uh, we've got two parts here. Part two of this admonition, verse seven, uh, verse six, is what Matthew or what Jesus reveals about the nature of the unbeliever in the dynamic of the hardened heart. Now, there's there's some people I know that I can't witness to. I can't help them. In fact, my trying to help them will do them more damage than it will do good. And I know that because they're very hostile towards me, and so I I let somebody else do that, or I pray for God to bring someone else. So when a believer attempts to force the truth upon the unbeliever, the believer, uh, the believer's lack of compassion then generates contempt for that truth in the heart of the unbeliever. And then second, when the believer tries to force the unbeliever into subjection to God's holy word, this creates hatred in the unbeliever towards the believer. It's natural. You're the messenger. And ends any possibility of the unbeliever heeding the truth now or in the future. So when I deal with a rebel or someone who has got a hardened heart, I deal with them completely different, uh, differently than I deal with a person whose heart is open to truth. And uh, we have to understand the difference. So then the human will, not now in contempt, hardens its heart to anyone trying to reach them in the future, and thereby often sealing the destiny of that unbeliever in a hardened unbelief. Otherwise they get harder and they get harder and they get harder. Now, I've had some of those people over the years come to church. And I remember one person, it took almost three years before they opened their spirit and let me deal with some of the issues of which they were struggling. Three years of patience endurance. Now, if I had pushed that right away, they'd have been gone. I wouldn't have had a chance to minister to them. But we've become very close friends over the years because we let them choose their own timetable. And Christ's pattern, now listen to this, Christ's pattern was to appeal to the rebels and unbelievers by exposing them to the consequences of their unbelief in a, in, in a straightforward way. Contending for the faith must take these issues into careful consideration, consideration lest we more do, do more damage than good. So contenders must maintain the perspective that while contending for the faith, they are also contending for the soul of the unbeliever. So look to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at 24. Again, we're giving instruction in the second epistle of Paul to Timothy, one of the pastoral epistles. 
And this just precedes the text where Paul says, there will come a time in the last days where men shall be lovers of their own self. They will not endure sound doctrine. So how do you deal with those people? Uh, you get bigger Bibles? <laughs> that's, that's not the way uh, we deal with it. Now the answer here is this. You don't get bigger Bibles. You get a smaller self. Did you listen to that now? You don't get a bigger Bible, you get a smaller self. You humble yourself. You become smaller. You become less. You become lower. And you come from down here in your approach to people. So he says this. What's the key word here? And the servant. How does the servant approach? How does the servant approach? From down here. The servant approaches. This is how you deal with the rebel. This is how you deal with someone whose heart is hardened to the truth. Now, both of these are true of the soft, of the saved rebel and the lost person who's hardened to the truth. You come from down here. Your approach get, becomes soft and gentle. It becomes as a servant. You're not lording over them. Uh, and the servant of the Lord, now what does it say? Must not strive. No servant would ever think of striving. Would ever think of talking bad. Would ever think of fighting or arguing. Because why? You're viewing the person to which you are ministering as the master. He's the one in charge. Right? Now, he might be living like the devil, but as far as your approach to him, he's in charge. And by the way, he is. He'll listen to you or not listen to you, but he's in charge of his ears. He's in charge of his heart. So you're approaching him as a servant. So the servant of the Lord must not stray. He must not fight or argue. But what? Now, that's what he can't do. Now, here's what he's supposed to do. But be gentle. What's that mean? Friendly. Good nature. Congenial. It's all about your how you approach these people. He is, be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. What's that mean? That's instructive. Patient. Uh, that's that's the enduring and willingness to wait. <laughs> we're, we're not willing to wait so many times. We want to rush forward. Uh, in meekness. What is that? Gentle humility. Not proud. Not overbearing. Uh, instructing those that oppose themselves. I'm witnessing to a man right now. And I know where he's at. <laughs> I, I know the struggles he's at. He's. He's a man that comes from another denomination. He's been in that denomination for 70 years of his life. He grew up in it. He's been in that denomination for 70 years of his life. I began with an initial contact with him, became acquainted with him, and shared the gospel with him fully through the whole plan of salvation, five verbs of faith. I said, now here's what you need to think about. You need to be saved. And uh, I said... Uh, uh, by your answers to my questions, I don't believe you are saved. You need, you must be born again. Now, right now, I haven't seen him for a while. Uh, at least he's not come back over. But what, what am I waiting? I, I'm being patient. I'm waiting on him. And you know, I'll, I'll talk to him again. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna do so in gentle humility. I'm not gonna be proud. I'm not gonna be overbearing. No matter how much I do, the more I try to force the issue, the more damage I'm going to do. But I know, are you listening now? I know that the truths I gave him are not stopped simply because I'm not there anymore. There is a spirit of God who is in the world who continues to use those truths and he will think about those things. And when he is ready... I'll be able to talk to him again. So what? In meekness, instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. What's their biggest problem? It's, you know, don't make you the biggest problem. Their biggest problem is that they oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance, you're not going to bring anybody to repentance. It's going to be God's word, the operations of the Spirit of God. That's going to bring someone to repentance. But you have to what? You have to be meek and patient while God does that. 
And I, I've seen it over the years. It's taken years. Some, some people it takes just a matter of a few minutes. Some people it takes weeks, months. Well, I know some people it's taken years. One person that came here, I remember it took six years um, for her to finally get saved. So, and then it says, and that, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You can't ever get somebody saved by you believing for them. So it's not what you believe that makes a big difference when they get saved. Otherwise, you've got to communicate that. You contend for that. So you can communicate that truth. But the job is to persuade them to believe. And in that persuasion, they recover themselves. Because you have to believe themselves. Uh, and they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Who are taken captive by his will. Now, therefore, if we claim we are contending for the faith, while maintaining the reality of contending for the souls of sinners, we should be able to pass the test that comes to us in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And we'll give you five questions that are in the test of this text, the test of the text. Okay, so answer these five questions and you can tell if, if you are being successful. But, if we fail in one point in our evaluation of our contending, we have failed to contend in the manner which Scripture instructs us to contend. So what do we do? We stop contending? No, we change our methodology. And we adapt and adopt biblical methodology. First of all, question one, did we argue or persuade in the spirit of compassion? Did we argue? Or did we persuade in a spirit of compassion? Arguing is more about proving your point. And that's an ego trip in many cases. It's prideful. We're not here to prove our prove ourselves right. We're to convince the person that we have compassion for their soul. So in the presenting of the truth, there ought to be genuine compassion. The answer must come from the person for which we contend. We can ask ourselves that question, but if their evaluation of that, they're going to shut down right there. How did they perceive what we said and what we did? Because that's what's going to determine, not, not you. Number two, were we friendly, considerate, sweet-spirited, congenial, uh, and congenial listening, uh, Hearing and carefully considering the things a person for which we contend is saying. Or are we just dumping information? How would this person evaluate us in this arena? How, how would they evaluate us? Did we actually hear what they say? And then respond? Now, I, I always do something like this. Now, I want to make sure I understand what you said. I make. I, I want to make sure I understand what you believe. So, uh, could you give me some scripture to support what you're saying? Uh, I, I really want to understand. Um, or maybe could you explain that uh, to me uh, in in another way? Because yeah, I'm a little bit confused. So, what you're communicating is I'm really listening, and I really want to hear what you got to say. Third. Was our conversation instructive, asking questions about Scripture and what the person for which we contend understands from that Scripture? So we take a verse of Scripture and we say, we don't, we don't just say, here's what I think this means. What do you think that verse of Scripture said? Or, can I read you a verse of Scripture? I, I've done this many times. And they say, well, yeah, you can, I, you, I, I can, you can read a verse of Scripture. I says, okay, I'll read a verse of Scripture. Well, what do you think that verse of Scripture says? What, what does that mean to you? Well, I don't really understand it. And then I'll read. I'll say, well, let me give you a couple verses on both sides of that. And then, and then we'll read some more scripture. What's God doing with scripture? He says, my word will not return unto me void. So as I'm reading scripture and they're listening it, and they're trying to understand. Right? They're trying to understand it because now their thinking is different because I, I, mean, I want them to explain to me what they know, or what they believe it says. Most of the time it's pretty simple. So, did that person with whom we spoke consider us to be spiritually proud and overbearing or humble and gentle with them? That's 
to number four. So how, how did they evaluate us? Spiritual pride. Now, <laughs> I've been studying the scriptures for a long, long time. I'm pretty well established in what they say. Now, that doesn't mean I know it all. I wouldn't go as far as to say that. But the person with whom we spoke, did they consider me to be uh, humble about my, my beliefs and, and gentle with them? I, I don't, you know, I may think in my mind, well, that's really stupid. <laughs> but I'm not going to say that to somebody. And I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe we re better read another verse of Scripture. And then number five, the fifth one. Are we trying to force or bully a person into subjection to our view? Or are we following the biblical pattern of God, allowing people, individual soul liberty, one of our Baptist distinctives, to make the free will choices given them by God, that's a gift of God, explaining that they will bear the consequences of choices right or wrong. I say, you know, I always tell people, you, you can believe whatever you like. You get to do that. And by the way, I'm going to love you either way. Whatever you choose to believe, I'm going to love you. And I'll be right here to talk with you. I'll accept you where you are in your life. I'm going to love you wherever you are. And uh, I'm always going to be open to have a conversation with you. But I'm going to give people individual soul liberty. Because I don't give it to them, actually. God gave it to them. And they'll answer for the consequences of their individual soul liberty choices. So they get, they have a free will and they get to exercise it. God didn't create a bunch of robots. I'm just, uh, I'm just doing and acting in the place of God as the ambassador of God, as a, as a priest of God, to let them do what God gave them. And that's important. So then I will explain them that they bear the consequences of their choices Right or wrong. You sow, you reap what you sow. You sow corruption, you'll reap corruption. You sow the things of God, you'll reap that. Now, we're going to uh, stop right there. It's almost quarter two. Any questions or comments tonight? Okay. Okay, we'll take some prayer requests. I'll have a word of prayer here first. Father God, thank you for this instruction from your word tonight and Lord, thank you for both the teachings of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we know that these are all your word and you've given us instruction in these things because uh, you want to help us to be effective for you. Uh, you want us to be your ambassadors and to represent you, not ourselves. And so, Father, we pray and thank you for the instruction that you give us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen.